I'm Maria Elena Giassi, and this is Currents. Iowa caucus results may have been surprising, but are they an accurate indicator? The Iowa winner hadn't always been the nominee, the New Hampshire winner hadn't always been the nominee, but since 1980, we have picked the eventual nominee. Plus, there's fresh attacks on Christians in one African country. And two schools in one Brooklyn neighborhood come together to preserve Catholic education there. Education is not something static. Uh, it's not something that you stop. It's dynamic and it changes all the time. Good evening and thank you for joining us. With Iowa in the books, Republicans are looking to the next primary battle, New Hampshire. Voters there will head to the polls next Tuesday, but as we hear from CNN's Mary Snow, the results may not mean much going forward. Iowa created a top tier of Republican candidates. Michelle Bachman's now out, and others are fighting for momentum heading into New Hampshire. But the head of South Carolina's Republican Party predicts his state will provide the next real make or break moment. The Iowa winner hadn't always been the nominee. The New Hampshire winner hadn't always been the nominee. But since 1980, we have picked the eventual nominee. And so I believe this is where the race really starts. And I think this is where it's going to be decided, too. Case in point, the 2008 Republican primary, where Mike Huckabee won Iowa with the help of evangelicals. But John McCain eventually became the party's nominee. Like Iowa, the Christian right has a heavy influence in South Carolina, but there are some key differences among voters there. In 2008, 60% of South Carolina's Republican primary voters were evangelicals or born-again Christians. Of the 40% not in that category, they favored John McCain over Mike Huckabee leading McCain to win the state. Political watchers say social issues are a motivating force for evangelicals in South Carolina but not a sole factor. Simply saying I'm an evangelical is not enough to win them over. You have to say I'm the evangelical candidate or I'm a moral candidate. Um, I am concerned about the social issues you're concerned with, but I'm also concerned about the debt and the deficit. Along with fiscal conservatives, there's also a large number of active and retired military personnel living in South Carolina. And a win here is seen as key to winning the South. If you can appeal to the conservatives in South Carolina, if you can win in the heat and occasional dirty politicking of South Carolina, then you're the type of candidate who has the metal to move on. It does often provide a firewall. One other thing to watch in South Carolina is the issue of jobs in the economy. Unlike Iowa and New Hampshire, where the unemployment rate is below the national average, South Carolina's unemployment rate is 9.9%. That report from CNN's Mary Snow. In other campaign news, GOP frontrunner Mitt Romney earned the endorsement of Arizona Senator John McCain, the man who won the Republican presidential nomination in 2008. I am really here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to make sure that we make Mitt Romney the next president of the United States of America and New Hampshire and New Hampshire is a state that will catapult him on to victory in a very short period of time. That's why I'm here. McCain also took some swipes at the two Catholic candidates vying for the Republican nod. The Arizona senator said he strongly disagreed with then-Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum's support of earmarks during Santorum's time in the Senate. McCain also said that when Newt Gingrich called Mitt Romney a liar, he crossed a line. Speaking with CNN, McCain said, you need to be careful about being too angry. He also acknowledged that endorsements have limited effect in the final outcome. There's more currents ahead. A Catholic governor out west announces her support for same-sex marriage. We'll have that stories and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Maria Elena Giassi. Coming up later, two schools became one to preserve Catholic education in one Brooklyn neighborhood. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. In other news on the primary trail, Rick Santorum is under greater scrutiny after his surprisingly close second place finish at the Iowa caucuses on Tuesday. Santorum, who is Catholic and a social conservative, was asked last night during an interview on CNN to explain his views on homosexuality. As you know, my Catholic faith teaches 
that uh, to uh, that it's actions that are that uh, that are the problems, not not necessarily someone's feelings. And that's I was reflecting Catholic teaching on the subject, and I think basically Christian teaching on the subject that that one can have desires to do things which we believe are wrong, but it's when you act out those things that, that is a problem. And, and I was simply reflecting that, uh, that, that opinion and that, that belief structure that I happen to hold as a Catholic. And in a separate interview with ABC, Santorum says states have the right to ban contraception, arguing that the issue is not a question of constitutional rights. He says states should also have the right to ban sodomy. Both issues have, become, have come before the Supreme Court, with the High Court ruling against the states in those cases. Meanwhile, a college in Colorado is heading to court to oppose a mandate that it provide contraception in its employee health plan. Reporter Rick Salinger has the story. This university offers a group health plan to its employees and students. Under a federal mandate, that plan must offer contraceptives. That leaves the school's administration, led by former U.S. Senator Bill Armstrong, facing an important ethical question. Whether or not people, or in our case universities, who have sincerely held moral convictions against abortion, should nonetheless be required to pay for it and support it and endorse it in effect. They are suing the federal government, naming the Departments of Health and Human Services, Labor and Treasury as defendants, charging a deliberate attack by the government on the religious beliefs of Colorado Christian and millions of other Americans. What do you think of this lawsuit? Emily C. Iles is the executive director of a Colorado pro-choice group and feels the university's lawsuit is misleading. No one is compelling anyone to take action against their religious beliefs. They are making contraception more accessible and affordable for those who want to take contraception. The fight over abortion rights has been a bitter one, extending from the clinics to the courts. And now pro-life advocates feel the federal government has taken another step too far a step this university will not take. Well, I suppose if we lose that uh, one option we will look at, in fact, one option we would almost certainly uh, avail ourselves of, is to simply stop offering uh, health insurance coverage to our employees. Last month, St. Petersburg, Florida Bishop Robert Lynch announced that his diocese may end health coverage for its employees if they are forced to provide contraception and health plans. Bishop Lynch said the diocese would instead give employees cash to buy health insurance on their own. And it's another push to legalize same-sex marriage, this time in Washington state. Governor Christy Gregory announced yesterday that she will support a bill that would give same-sex couples in her state the right to marry. I believe in equality and respect of all citizens. And I can't sit here any longer and say it's okay to discriminate. And I'll tell you what I really can't believe is we, we try and tell the children, the children of loving couple, that somehow their kids are different, that their relationship, their love is somehow different than the love of a heterosexual couple. I don't believe that. That's just not right. In an interview with a Seattle TV station, Gregory, a Catholic, says she spoke with Seattle Archbishop Peter Sartain, who did not agree with the governor's position, but was, quote, very understanding of the journey I've been through. Washington State has a Defense of Marriage Act, and the Archdiocese of Seattle says it is looking for the legislature to uphold the measure. The Archdiocese says it will also be monitoring the issue closely to ensure that religious exemptions are included in any legislation. Meanwhile, another prominent religious figure in Washington state says there is plenty of opposition to Gregory's move. Several other senators, several other representatives, uh, several of the Christian organizations, several other churches and pastors, and we're going to fight like we've never fought before on this because we have to. One Washington senator who has supported past efforts for same-sex rights says a bill to legalize same-sex marriage may have a tough time passing in the Senate where Democrats hold just a five-vote majority. And from Pennsylvania, a Muslim woman has settled a discrimination lawsuit against the Diocese of Allentown. The woman, who previously worked for a Catholic church there, said she was fired after complaining about the way she was treated. She says the pastor there questioned her about dietary restrictions, 
and forced her to take a lunch break during Ramadan, when Muslims fast during daylight hours. The woman, who had been a part-time employee, also claimed she was not given health care benefits, despite the fact that other part-timers received health coverage. The Allentown Diocese denies the pastor was ever hostile and said other part-time employees qualified for health insurance because they worked at other jobs elsewhere in the diocese. And a Minnesota judge has ordered the arrest of an attorney there who made repeated anti-Catholic slurs in court documents. Bankruptcy Judge Nancy Dreher held attorney Naomi Isaacson in contempt after she failed to appear in court yesterday. Back in November, Isaacson filed a memo that Judge Dreher said was replete with unsupported and outrageous allegations of bigotry, deceit, conspiracy, and scandalous statements. The memo referred to the judge as a black-robed bigot and a Catholic knight witch hunter. The memo also accused the court of conspiring against the group for which the lawyer works. Judge, judge Dreher wrote last month that she has never been Catholic and not of any particular faith. In court on Wednesday, she said her religious views are not relevant to the case in question. From Australia, a priest is calling on two supermarkets there to remove the cross from their hot cross buns. The buns are typically eaten on Good Friday, and the priest says selling them so early in the year is taking away from the religious significance of the practice. He's calling on Woolworths and Coles to remove the cross from the buns and return it on Good Friday. A spokesman for Cole says it's up to the customers to decide how they will observe religious holidays. He says the store puts the cross on the buns because that's how the customers like them. From Italy, a convicted criminal says he would rather go back to jail than spend any more time in a monastery. The man who was found guilty of theft was ordered to serve his sentence at a monastery in Sicily. He escaped twice and asked police to send him back to jail. He says life at the monastery can be pretty tough. He says the monks wake up and go to bed too early. The man also says the monastery has no modern conveniences. The police have complied with his wishes and sent him back to jail. And a surprising find at a monastery in Buffalo. A nun there discovered a tapestry believed to contain the relics from 365 saints, as well as relics of Jesus. According to a report, the Vatican gave the tapestry to then Buffalo Bishop John Tymon sometime in the 1850s or 1860s. After Bishop Tymon died, the tapestry was given to the Sister of St. Joseph, where it was quickly forgotten. The authenticity of the relics is not yet certain. Stay tuned, there's more currents ahead. Just ahead, on one of the holiest days, Christians in one African country face deadly violence. Welcome back. In some parts of the world, Christians are coming face to face with violence. According to the Christian support organization, Open Doors, Sudan and Northern Nigeria saw the greatest increase in Christian persecution last year. Sudan jumped 19 places on the list in a year, from number 35 all the way to number 16. And it was not much better in Nigeria, which jumped 10 places to number 13. And if you want a picture of the situation for Christians there, look no further than the past couple of weeks. On Christmas Day, at least 37 people were killed and another 57 wounded in two bombings, including one at a Catholic church. Earlier this week, Boko Haram, the group that claimed responsibility for those bombings, issued an ultimatum for all Christians in the northern region of Nigeria to leave. For more on the situation there, our news director, Ed Wilkinson, spoke earlier today with Edward Clancy, director of outreach and evangelization for the Catholic organization Aid to the Church in Need. Ed Clancy from uh, Aid to the Church in Need, thanks for being with us today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having uh, me. It's been a rough time in Nigeria, as we hear in the news, uh, some Christmas Eve bombings over there and then some more activity near New Year's Eve. Yeah. Uh, what are we looking at here? Is this, uh, is this a religious war or, or is it something more than that? I, I think it, it definitely has a very strong religious element, but it's also a political issue. Um, in the northern states, uh, the Boko Haram, who started the, who is claiming responsibility for the bombings, wants all southern influence out of their area. Mm -hmm. And the word Boko Haram actually means 
anything non-Islamic uh, is a sin. So they're the people in the north, right? Mm -hmm. And most of the Christians are in the south. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And most of the Catholics are in the east, mm -hmm. in southeast. Okay. And so Boko Haram was started, uh, well, I'm not sure how long ago, but uh, the, the goal is first and foremost to stop the, as they call it, the European or Western education, seen mostly because of the Catholic Church is, is there to educate many people. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in a lot of these countries, very limited education is accepted, and then anything beyond that is, 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 is seen as suspicious. Mm -hmm. So the Catholic Church, educates everyone. In, in some dioceses, there are schools with 70% Muslims in their, in their diocesan schools. Hmm. So the church has never turned anyone away. The Catholic Church in Nigeria is a pretty strong presence, right? It's pretty well organized. Very well organized. Mm -hmm. There's 50 dioceses. In fact, dioceses. it's one of the greatest sources of vocations, right? Yes, yeah. there are. Mm -hmm. um, there are 2,000 seminarians presently in upper seminary and some 10,000 if you include all of the lower levels. Mm -hmm. That's an astronomical number compared to many other Western co uh, countries. Sure, sure. Yeah. Now the bishops uh, in Nigeria, uh, the Nigerian Bishops Conference has been very strong. Mm -hmm. They've said that uh, these bombings of churches are equivalent to an act of war. Well, Boko Haram has essentially declared jihad mm -hmm. on anything you know, non-Islamic, and the Catholic Church stands as one of the great symbols of, of non-Islamic institution. Mm -hmm. So, in essence, yes, there, there is an act of war against the church. Mm -hmm. And how about uh, your group, Aid to the Church in Need? You, you have a presence there in Nigeria. Yes, right? uh, we support many projects, and uh, we've sent over $7 million in the last ten y um, five years mm -hmm. uh, there, and we support many vocations. We support construction of churches and seminaries and of other buildings. We also support pastoral aid. And uh, we support a group of nuns, uh, you know, the sisters of uh, Our Lady of Fatima, who go and live among the poorest of the poor and do things like water purification, food, uh, you know, food and um, food procurement, medical procurement, providing education, things mm -hmm. like that. Now, what are you hearing from those people? Uh, do you have any direct contact with them since Christmas? Uh, yes, we we have some people directly on the ground. Um, you know, well, we don't. We have contact with people on the ground, mm -hmm. and it's generally through the diocese. So we communicate with the different diocesan communications departments, mm -hmm. and then our uh, our staff in Europe, which is much closer, can go and make phone calls or actually go and visit. So there's mm -hmm. there's usually a few visits a year to Nigeria to the different places, including the, the very problematic areas. Mm -hmm. And the civil unrest that's going on right now, is that a threat to what you're trying to do there? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. The, the, the threat is mainly just to create unrest and also to push people from doing what's normal. Um, most of the, the Catholic population in the southeast, uh, they almost wanted cordon there. They wanted pushed in that, is that region so that there is no influence in the upper states. Mm -hmm. There are 12 states in the north that have Sharia, and some of them have enforced very strict Sharia to the point of, you know, outlawing alcohol, outlawing, you know, Western dress, and forcing Catholics and Catholic um, uh, or Christian uh, businesses out of business, telling mm -hmm. them that they're not wanted. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, this group, uh, Boko Haram, uh, is that a radical sect of Islam? Because, yes. I mean, there does seem to be some sympathetic voices in the Muslim community. Oh, absolutely. There, yeah. there are some very good relationships. I yeah. mean, as I was saying, 70% of some schools are, uh, are Islamic children. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a very deep inculturation of the Catholic and Islamic, uh, you know, coexistence. Mm -hmm. And so th the, the, real, the real problem is from outside sources that yeah. you have, you know, the, where there's the Wahhabis or other institutions outside of Nigeria seeking to, to declare Nigeria an Islamic state. Yeah. And uh, the issue there is th the number of people. There are over 167 million people in Nigeria. And essentially, that's a large mass of humanity that they want yeah. to have control of. So what can we do? I mean, uh, we should, can we stay in touch with your website? Uh, yes, if you, go to our, going on? Yeah, if you go to our website, we will have uh, updates of okay. the news and also projects, ways to help. Okay. And it's uh, wheregodweeps.org. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, uh, the information source. And then also the Aid to the Church in Need, which is churchinneed.org. Okay. So either one of them would provide you with some information. Great. Ed Clancy, thanks for taking out the time and uh, coming and uh, filling us in on what's going on in Nigeria. Thank you very much for having me. 
stay tuned. There's more currents ahead. When we return, a new day for Catholic education in one Brooklyn neighborhood. Our primary goal is to journey with a child so that they develop a relationship with Christ. Finally tonight, the Diocese of Brooklyn is undergoing a process known as Preserving the Vision, an effort to keep Catholic education alive in the diocese and allow it to thrive for years to come. Schools are changing to what is known as an academy model that involves two or more schools merging into one. In September, St. Catherine of Genoa, St. Therese of Lisieux in Flatbush was one of three new academies to open their doors. And for the teachers, administrators, and families involved in the merger, the process was not easy. But as we found out, the results speak for themselves. St. Catherine of Genoa, St. Therese of Lisieux Academy is our School of the Week. We are grateful to have two very fine saints watching over us daily. St. Catherine, we represent by a flame because of one of the things that she said was, if you are what you should be, you would set the world ablaze. And it's what we want for our children. St. Therese is represented by the rose. And her quote is, do ordinary things in extraordinary ways. Our primary goal is to journey with a child so that they develop a relationship with Christ. That is our essence. It's why we do what we do. There were six schools or seven schools in this East Flatbush cluster. And then slowly, year after year, another one left and another one closed and reopened to something else and closed. We knew that the writing was on the wall because our registrations kept going down. In an effort to keep Catholic education alive in this particular area of East Flatbush, the only answer would be to merge two schools together. Now, of course, that meant you had to meld somehow these two different ways that the two different schools actually did work. I did have to change subjects completely. Uh, I did math at St. Catharines. I do science now. So it, it is interesting, and it was different, and it was challenging. But you know, I love the job. I love teaching. So I just changed accordingly. There's been a lot of negative stories about Catholic school uh, closing. And we heard all the time in the press about uh, the schools closing. But if you really listened to what we were told, which was about, quote unquote, preserving the vision. And preserving the vision really was that, yes, we do have our sights on maintaining Catholic education. Is it still feasible to keep the same model? No, it wasn't feasible. In order for it to continue, then we would have to sort of change our model and our method. My tagline is Catholic School of Excellence in East Flatbush. The academics in both schools were excellent. And both schools had very similar visions. Education is not something static. It's not something that you stop. It's dynamic and it changes all the time. So it made sense. We're trying to have the students understand that they are learning for life. We're only with them a brief period and then they're going on. And hopefully what they're getting here will see them through high school and beyond. I really love seeing all the children. We had a fairly decent enrollment of, I think it was 240 or something like that. Now we're close to 400. They all have dreams. We have to help them fulfill some of those dreams. I think we are on the right road. I see happy children, which is the most important thing. I see content parents. I see happy faculty. It does keep the dream alive. I'm always amazed when children who are not necessarily baptized Catholic want to become Catholic. And when we witness their baptism at Easter, they're that's more than a salary. That's, that's our goal. It's, it will continue because there are always people searching for an education that is not only excellent, but value-based.
And that is all for this edition of Currents. Coming up tomorrow, it's that time of year, the annual Three Kings Parade. We'll take you to it. Until then, be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And if you have a question, comment, or story idea, email us. The address is drop us a line at CurrentsNY.net. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Maria Elena Giassi. Thank you for watching. Have a great night. Thank you.